If you guys have any questions for my guests for these type of videos, leave a comment down in the section below and the most liked comments will be asked in the very next time they appear on my channel. Hi, welcome to the very first interview with special guests from all around the YouTube tennis community and other YouTube content creators such as myself. I'm your host, Mark Sansett, and the very first the very first guest is Micah Babel, who used to be top 27 in the world and was on the professional WTA tour for quite a long time. Micah, welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, and uh, thank you for having me. Sure. So getting more familiar with our audience and who you are, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it. Um, I played on the WTA tour for 10 years. Um, highest ranking was 27. Um, turned pro when I was 16. Um, didn't quite know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, but stayed injury free for a fairly long time, made it to 27. Um, I retired in 2001, mm -hmm. um, which is when I came over here to the US. I coached collegiately at uh, both Tulane and Vanderbilt mm -hmm. as going to school um, at the same time. And then I moved to Atlanta in 2008 and moved here to Denver, Colorado in uh, 2016. And I've been here ever since. It's pretty awesome to hear because uh, with the YouTube tennis community, there is this gentleman by the name of Tennis Troll, who you're probably familiar with. And I've actually had friends that grew up in Atlanta or actually live there right now. And they're saying Atlanta is actually like the tennis capital of the world yes. for the U.S. right now. And then yes. Denver, Colorado, you know, people think of skiing, they think of snowboarding, they, they think of, you know, all these cool things outside of, uh, you know, the actual city of Denver and all these cities in Colorado. But there's a big tennis community in Colorado as yeah. well. I just didn't know that. And a lot of my audience didn't know that as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, we have, I think um, the Colorado State Open is the biggest uh, rec tournament, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's an incredible uh, city, and I mean that's one of the reasons you know why I moved here. But um, Atlanta was also one of the reasons why I moved there because I mean, they're tennis crazy. Yeah, it's just fantastic, and you can obviously play year round. Mm -hmm. um, but little known fact, you can play outdoors. Yeah, uh, year round here in Colorado. I mean, yes, there's a couple of snow days, mm -hmm. um, but you can play. Yeah, and I'm hoping, um, as you said, the Colorado State Open, I'm hoping once this whole pandemic is a lot more yes. settled and a little bit more open, I definitely want to uh, yeah. <laughs> definitely want to visit and get my ass kicked by uh, your uh, probably some of your students and colleagues <laughs> sometime in the near future. Let me just sure about that. Yeah. yeah. I, I won't tell you. <laughs> okay. Um, leading into the first question, um, do you have a coaching philosophy? I know your background is very, very different compared to what a typical coach uh, tennis instructor would be. So did any of your life experiences or any of your disciplines from being a world-class professional tennis player that toured the world, did any of them bleed over into your current coaching philosophy at your current job? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I was very fortunate that I had really, really great coaches, mm -hmm. not so great coaches, some, um, but I picked, you know, the, the, um, best things out from everybody and i think the the one thing that my best coaches or that i resonated best with um those coaches they treated me as a person first mm -hmm. um it wasn't that i was a player so very instrumental in my earlier development was actually a female coach um in our state at home um really great with just you know, making every single practice about that student. Didn't yep. matter who it was, but it was always, it was never cookie cutter. Yep. Um, asking questions, kind of empowering you to actually really take ownership. Um, and then I was super fortunate to coach with uh, Coach Jeff McDonald at Vanderbilt. And uh, when, when I talked to him about taking the position as his assistant, you know, we got talking, obviously. And uh, one of the things that really... Uh, stuck with me was like, hey, Fabs, that was my nickname, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know. Um, we have 10 people, 10 young women. You got to find 10 different ways to yep. get across what you want to get across. So to me, it's really you come to me as a client and you are an individual. You're a person first. 
Um, I don't have to benefit from your success. You know, I have my own sort of, yeah. so I'm not having to bask in your glory. Um, but it's really, to me, the, the fun part is to figure out exactly what that individual needs. And it's, it's never a cookie cutter attempt. So that's what I'm trying to bring to the court. And that's kind of what I'm trying to stick with. So when it comes to, you know, obviously piggybacking off of that question of that, that comment about finding out what your student or your client needs, is it for you, is it just kind of like asking, hey, this is our first lesson. What exactly do you want with tennis? Or do you kind of feel it out before you start guessing or even asking those probing questions of like, okay, maybe this person is looking for something different than I initially thought, maybe two or three lessons yeah. in. Yeah, and it can totally happen that way. But I think it's a it's a back and forth. I'm asking a lot of questions. I always want to know about the the background of the person. Did they play other sports? Um, you know, because you can get a feel a little bit for, for yeah. the person. For instance, today I had a former Division One soccer player. Hmm. So you can kind of take away, oh, that's probably a highly competitive person. And, you know, you're not just going to hit balls with them. They want to know. They want to know the depths of, you know, the game. So I'm assuming um, with that uh, individual, the D1 soccer player or former D1 soccer player, f yes. footwork and fitness are not an issue for your lessons with that individual. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the strategy may be so. And that's exactly what it ended up being. So, um, but yeah, it, it's always a back and forth. I always ask questions. Um, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? And, you know, it, it's always different. I mean, I, I'd start the lesson with that every time. So yeah. it's not the one time I'm asking it. And then I take that information for the rest of the, you know, whatever year or something that we work together. Mm -hmm. Well, um, following up then, who's your favorite type of tennis player to coach or teach? Anybody who wants to learn. Mm. I don't care if you're 80, if you're uh, a total beginner, if you're a 5-0, women, men, any anybody who wants to play mm. because to me again that's the fun part to to help somebody grow because it's such a fantastic game it is um, and i know that sounds very cliche mm -hmm. uh but i owe a lot of things to tennis and i think it's it's just a fantastic way also to meet great people yep that's what i'm always you know trying to help people do when they go you know when they travel somewhere or they move to a new place what do you do first well you go to a tennis club yep you know and you, you meet people um, so anybody who wants to play, um, and wants to learn, I'm not very good if it's <clears throat> glorified babysitting. Yep. We talked about um, that in the past. <laughs> um, and the good news is I think word has gotten around that that's not necessarily my forte. I good. don't want to do it and I'm very privileged that I don't have to do it. So yeah. I think it's people that want to learn. Do you think that you not having to do the over glorified babysitting type of tennis lessons, which in my opinion, every single professional tennis instructor has done in some capacity yes. because we all start and from enough, somewhere. I've paid my dues. Yes. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that, is that because of like the, the no BS um, lessons that you have the idea that, Oh, you actually want to have clients that are willing to learn no matter what age level, yep. no matter what gender, no matter what they want to accomplish. And do you think it also helps that you were a world-class and probably still are a world-class tennis player in your own right? Maybe in the over 45 group. <laughs> hey. Not quite sure. Um, no, I think that definitely has a lot to do with it. I mean, a lot of people, um, you know, that's the assumption that we have, that somebody played pro mm -hmm. and they're very determined, they're very, you know, they want to keep learning, um, which is not necessarily always the case. But yep. in my case, it's very true. I love learning about the game of tennis and that's also one thing that I took away from from Coach McDonald at, at Vanderbilt. He literally said, like, Babs, if you're still teaching the same way in five years that you're teaching now, you need to immediately stop yeah. because you haven't learned anything. Um, so I think it's a little self-selection for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but I think I'm also fairly blunt, me being German. Yeah. <laughs> that I will ask people, it's like, hey, okay, what do you want to get out of this lesson? And if I don't see that that's there then it's, I think, also a pretty natural kind of way that maybe we part ways. Yeah. And, and it's happened, and that's perfectly fine. So funny enough with that um, culture um, comment, and I, I completely yeah. agree with you. I, I have personally have never been to Germany. I've never been to any parts of Europe. Um, but a lot of my friends and former coworkers that have been to specifically Germany, 
they've noted it's not necessarily a rudeness thing in my opinion it's not a rudeness thing it's just you're very very blunt like for example yeah. if i want to invite someone to a party in in the americas they're kind of like gonna dodge the question they're gonna kind of like lie and make up an excuse where apparently in germany in certain parts of the world they will literally look you in the eye and say no because i don't want to and it's not yeah. like it's a rude thing it's just they don't they don't want to so it's yeah. it's amazing this cultural divide that you probably had to kind of like you know understand and, and, yes. and identify and kind of work your way around it where in um other cultures like my parents are you know from the philippines there were some things that i had to learn being um a generation american that was first born here yeah. from an immigrant family so that's probably a different yeah. conversation and in it, itself you know for some people it may still come across very blunt yeah you know, and that's that you know that's that's just who i am and i've i've already softened a lot yeah <laughs> so when i go home people go like oh you're so americanized yeah. by like you know just certain phrases that i'm translating into german that really have no translation so they go Correct. huh <laughs> um but yeah that that definitely has something to do with it i get away with it if somebody's not necessarily that comfortable with with it then then i'm probably also not their coach necessarily exactly um, so a, a very natural, let's say, a, a very natural question that you probably get when people realize, you know, you are that high up in the rankings in WTA, they have to ask, do you coach high performance juniors? No. I mean, they ask, and that's yep. the assumption. So that's really funny when, when, you know, last year, for instance, I taught beginner classes. And people are like, why the heck? Mostly my fellow coaches. Yeah. Like, why the heck did you pick this class? Um, it's just fun, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah. W would it be fun to to coach a high level player? Absolutely. Um, but since we're all a little bit part whack job, to be perfectly <laughs> honest, um, it's there's other issues. Yes, the the athletic ability, the tennis ability is absolutely there, but then there's other issues that are not as enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I definitely do not enjoy is dealing with parents. Yep. Um, and I'm also very open about that. I mean, I'm I'm turning lessons down fairly often because of that assumption that I only want to wear, um, work with with high level players. Yep. Um, and it's it's just too much. Um, you know, I've been a high level junior. I know that I had a screw loose, so I don't want to have to deal with that again. <laughs> yeah. So you having a screw loose and basically everybody that is above 200 in the world for ATP and WTA, or at least a few yeah. uh, loose screws, you obviously needed to have like an influence to kind of like calm you down, to kind of bring you down to earth. Because, you know, just like me, I, you know, I coach about 10 to 15 hours a week part time, obviously. You know, I, I don't have the accolades that you have and I never will. And I'm perfectly OK with that because I have a different path. Um, so when you're looking at these plethora of coaches you've had as not only a junior, but as a world class tennis player and also all the connections you've made on the tour, what are some of the most important and biggest influences you've ever had come to you for your own personal coaching? Um, as I said, that one female coach was really important for me. Um, well, I was very fortunate that, um, in the beginning, I actually stayed in my club environment. So it wasn't that I, I, I was a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I only started really, uh, showing any kind of sign of, of promise when I was 14, which now everybody tells you, okay, that's, you're not like, you know, a number one in your age group by 14, you're not going to make it. Yeah. Um, I disagree with that because I know that I, you know, I played club championships at age 14 and then six, two years later I turned pro. <laughs> um, so I think the influence that I had there was that I um, was very fortunate that a lot of kids my age were really good. So we kind of, you know, grew up pushing each other um, and still being friends. So mm -hmm. when you said like, keep me, you know, somewhat sane, that was definitely the, uh, the case. Um, and then really having coaches that looked out more for the development, uh, for me as a player, rather than just win, 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 win. Um, so everybody allowed me to develop, especially my dad, um, who actually was my coach until I turned pro. Mm -hmm. Um, it was all about, okay, we need to make you a complete player first and then we can, you know, 
worry about the winning or losing. And I lost a lot when I was younger, yep. but I think that helped me later uh, being a more complete player and not just having one game. S- speaking of game of like being a complete player, you're, you're talking about, you know, the tactics, the strategy, and you're, you're looking at these, not only just tennis professional athletes, but professional athletes in general, they're physical monsters for the most part. I mean, you're looking at the ATP uh, side, the, the men's professional tennis side. You've got people like Juan Martin Del Potro, who's six foot six, and he moves like he's six foot one. You have someone like Rafa Nadal, who's six one, six two. But I was shocked when I saw that he wasn't like five foot eight or five foot nine, just because he's so physically imposing and so quick around the court for having such a big, broad frame, especially on the upper body. Yeah. But one thing that people don't really talk about, at least on the recreational side, when we look at, you know, (laughs) gods among men, such as yourself, is how important is it to work on the mental skills of the competitive tennis, especially at the world class level? What 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 tips do you have for any possible uh, juniors that possibly might have the talent or might want to try to go professional at some point in their life? So, I mean, you, you see the same development on the on the women's tour. So it's not just the men's. I mean, when, when I started playing, when I turned pro, I was considered one of the bigger kids. Mm-hmm. And at the end of my career, all of a sudden you had people like Safina, Kim Kleisters, Lindsay Davenport. I mean, all uh, Maria Sharapova, the Williams sisters. Mm-hmm. And they're six foot three or something. Yep. And I'm five eight. So all of a sudden I'm this little shrimp. Mm-hmm. Um, so physically, everybody is unbelievable. Um, so that's your first thing. You, you have to be physically great. Um, the mental side, I think, for the longest part has been neglected and I think is still incredibly neglected, mm-hmm. um, especially with younger kids. I mean, when we uh, start here in Colorado, we had something called Team Colorado. Unfortunately, the pandemic kind of nixed that program. Yep. Um, but we started with our eight year olds hmm. um, to work on, on really just very broad mental skills like what do i do if i feel panicky okay take deep breaths you know take your time that kind of stuff um not so much in depth but what we're asking of these juniors is i mean under 12 year olds is what i did when i turned pro and which kid is prepared to deal with that none Mm -hmm. so um that definitely is one thing that that's missing and i think that's a really really big thing if you find a good coach they know that um, they have not forgotten, let's put it this way, they have not forgotten how much they struggled when they were juniors. Yeah. Um, because you can't tell me that you didn't struggle. That, that would be not quite human. So how, how would that translate to the recreational level? I think mental skills is super important for anybody who plays because as humans, we react the same way under stress as professionals. So you freeze up, you get tight, you can't breathe, you make stupid decisions. Um, and the only reason why professionals deal with it better is because they have practice in it mm. every single day. Um, of course, a lot of them now have mental skills coaches, which is phenomenal because it's kind of destigmatizing the whole thing. Um, but I think it, mental skills is absolutely something for rec players. Yep. When it comes to the mentality and uh, coaching style that you have mentioned, and you know, obviously you hammered uh, very well on that last point. When it comes to your own coaching uh, styles and philosophies, do you coach a male and a female differently, assuming that they have similar personalities and they have similar game styles, they're at a similar level, and they have similar goals? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and this is just how men and women are differently socialized. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm giving you an example, again, happened today. Mm-hmm. Um, had a group with all women. You hear, sorry. 59,000 times. Yeah. And that's when I'm going like, no, 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 stop that. We have four athletes on the court. If you shank the ball, she can run it down. Yeah. Um, so stop apologizing. So, only time. so I think you should apologize if you hit somebody, to be honest yeah. with you. So if it's a if it's a group of four guys um, that are like probably four or higher and they're full machismo, they'd probably be cheering every let court winner every time they hit each other at the net. Yeah. Okay. And you have all kinds of <laughs> posturing. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have very, very uh, many men that are in touch with their inner feminine side, so that's good. Um, No, but it definitely is uh, issues with we're not socialized, uh, being okay with being aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not something that is, you know, rewarded when you're a female. Um, It gets you called all kinds of names. So 
how do I help people on court be aggressive? And it's okay to be aggressive on court mm -hmm. when you can off court, you can do whatever you want, yep. but it's not going to be helpful to be tentative, to be, you know, uh, not assertive on court. So, um, I think I critique differently to be perfectly honest. I think I'm a lot more, um, helping in, uh, getting the inner voice a little bit more positive because that's also another thing that women do more. Mm -hmm socialized again, uh, that we just internalize our own critiques. So self-talk of guys and self-talk of women is very, very different. So um, when did you realize that? Because obviously me being a guy, every single self-talk I've ever had yeah. in my life is me as a guy. It's not like I could yeah. just, you know, go back in time and flip, you know, the chromosomes when my parents conceived me. And then I'm like, oh, this is a little bit different. Yeah. And then go back to being a guy. It's not how it works. Yeah. So when did you realize that other than just you observing the way yeah. culture, specifically Western culture, um, raises the two different genders slash sexes? Yeah, I mean, being a girl, I know what my self-talk is. Um, knowing also that how coaches in my past did not respond the way that would have been more helpful mm. for me. Um, so, and I, yeah, I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna repeat some of the things yeah. that they took for us. Um, but that I think was fairly clear, uh, fairly early. And when I did have that female coach, the talk between us was totally different. And her knowing that a little bit more, obviously I responded, not obviously, but I did respond very well, um, to it. And I think that's what we're now getting a little bit more. And it's now called athlete centered coaching. Um, and that's why I would love to see more females in the coaching, you know, sphere, but it's, yeah, it's a ratty job for a lot of things. Correct. Um, and that, that's amazing different. that you, you know, you brought that up because if you look yeah. at most coaches for both, I mean, if you look at the, the male coaching ATP coaches, 99.99% of their coaches are males, right? The biggest exception, and I thought this was a very smart move by Andy Murray, and you know where I'm going with this. He hired Amelie Moresmo, who at that time, I think she was already retired, but you know, a French yeah. tennis player. And I think she was number three. She was well accomplished. I don't know if she won a Grand Slam. She definitely got to the finals. Yeah, she won Wimbledon. Oh, she won that's Wimbledon. Why, yeah, that's why he hired her. Okay. Yeah. And that was when, when he was kind of questioned, like, yeah. why you I, I hired a Wimbledon champion. Yeah. That's how he said it. Exactly. And I thought that was really cool. And, you know, he, he, he threw shade back the reporters that were initially giving him shade because of the response yeah. that you had. And the, the greatest thing, the greatest evidence to for Andy Murray to shut those doubters down about, hey, why are you hiring a female? Well, yeah. I mean, she's an accomplished female, first of all, was under Amelie Moresmo, he got number one in the world, which he's never he's never yeah. done before. And obviously, you know, it didn't work out and he got uh, Ivan Lendl back and he won his, I think his first Grand Slam bringing Lendl back or I, I, think so, yeah. I don't know what the story was, but he needed someone with Omni Moresmo skills, whether it's a male or female, it just happens to be a female to get him to that number one spot in the world, which, you know, no one's yeah. done before outside of the likes of um, uh, Nadal, Federer, and I believe Djokovic before, before he, yeah. he got that number one spot. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a different processing. Um, you know, with guys, I can be a little more direct, more blunt. Yep. You know, they're, they're okay. They're not drawing everything to them or referring everything like, oh, did she now say I'm like, I'm doing this or they, they're just more external. Whereas, uh, women are more internal, mm -hmm. tend to be more internal. I'm stereotyping a little bit, but, yeah. um, but yeah, I definitely do, um, teach definitely kids differently when I have yeah. young girls then it's all about like listen don't take any crap yeah so it's one of those things too where like um let's see with my clientele at least you know in the past 75 percent were were boys 25 percent were girls and actually i would like to say almost 100 percent of the girls that i taught in my past i just wanted to say hey listen you need to be more aggressive you need to assert yeah. your dominance on the court more guys i i that, that's not a problem. At all. You that's, yeah. Just now. like, dude, calm down. Let's keep in touch with your feminine yeah. side a little bit. Let's take a deep breath. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> so I completely understand, you know, what, what you're, you're saying on all different types of levels, but obviously, you know, yeah. you had that 
world-class training. You've seen it on the professional tour a lot more, and you've probably, as you said, you you have experienced it on, uh, you know, both as a student and also as a tennis coach, which is fantastic to hear. So when it comes to your coaching, currently, like, so you're you're in Colorado right now. You've been in the states for quite a long time, a good part of your good part yeah. of your life. How, how many years is it now, Micah? Twenty. 20. Okay, so quite a long time, let's say. So, what services do you offer as a tennis coach, given that your very unique past and where you are currently in the mountains of Colorado, coaching tennis full time? Yeah, so I I teach at um, Gates Tennis Center, which is a public facility, which is what I love. Mm -hmm. There's not much, you know, politics going on. Let's yep. put it this way. Um, so I coach um, pretty booked up already. Um, very fortunate about that or very, very happy about that. Uh, mental skills is definitely one thing. So I'm doing one on one session. I'm working with um, athletes of all kinds of sports. So it's not just tennis. Um, because again, under stress, we react fairly similar, whether it's, you know, you're not getting off the starting block because you're, you know, swimming because you're freezing or you can't get a forehand in. Yep. Uh, because you're freezing pretty, pretty similar uh, physical processes. Um, stroke analysis is something that I definitely, I mean, kind of brushed up on a lot this past year, just a lot of online stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much about it. When it comes to the mental coaching, obviously, when people think of a professional tennis instructor, which is, you know, what you fall under into, but obviously you're, you're very unique in, in that sense where, you know, what you want to do and where you've been in the past. Is it kind of weird that you're giving a lesson and it is like, let's say, 50 to 75 percent coaching or talking things out instead of you at the service line with a continental grip, with a bucket of balls saying, bend your knees, swing through yeah. or more brush? Yeah, that's that's definitely not my my lesson stuff. <laughs> yeah. That that's one thing is I'm well, being European, being German, uh, we don't have much feeding. Um really? I use of course as progression. Mm -hmm. Um, but I hit in most of the time, which is not that easy if you're having, you know, one on one if you have private lessons. Um, but it really I would say it's almost more 60% mental skills. Uh, it depends on the lesson yeah. right? Um, and on the player and what they want to accomplish. But it, it's not just technique. I mean, I'm really trying to, to help most people with, with all four things. I mean, athletic development, um, although I'm not, you know, a personal trainer or something, but I can still recall some of the principles, obviously, that I used to train, but technical, tactical, and mental, because... A lot of my clients, thankfully, and that's kind of why I was drawn to to your channel, <laughs> um, is you compete. Yeah. And at some point, it's like, okay, this is what you got, technically, tactically. Um, can you can you reproduce it? You know, when you're out playing a match, mm -hmm. because everybody can hit when you know it doesn't count for anything. Um, so that's that's really what I'm trying to to help my clients the most with, to be honest. Oh, that's good, and like especially when it comes to singles and in, in, in the sport of tennis single specifically it's 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 even ground right it's what you've trained for what you've prepared for what you can execute versus the other person's um what they trained for what they executed yeah. and it, like you know it's a singles match there's no excuses you either win or you lose yeah. and then you take away what you can and get ready for the next one where ideally ideally if yeah. we if we're, if we're growth minded yes yeah, exactly so well I, I just i just hate the statement where like for example if i play someone and they beat me and people on my youtube comments says oh mark just had a bad day mark is a better tennis player than person b actually no like, I, I will def i will say that i'm like yeah i might have better looking strokes but the yeah. fact is we played a sport that we voluntarily stepped on the court for and he was the better person Maybe that day, but yep. stats are showing that yeah. that person beat me fair and square. I, I, yep. I hate that argument so much. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. I mean, especially if you, um, I mean, if you go on, I mean, you know, just take a couple of those matchups that, you know, on tour. Yep. Um, it depends on different surface. It depends on, you know, how deep in the tournament you are when they're, um, you know, getting each other. It's And it goes back and forth, back and forth. So can you really say he's the better player or she's the better player it's like every day is a new match you never know what's going to happen that day and i think that's i, I like that that you kind of you know 
you know, really pushing back on them. Yeah. And obviously I want to defend myself and my, my huge, yeah. huge ego, but it's one of those <laughs> things where I, I am self-critical and yeah. whatever standards I hold for my students or for my clients or for anyone around me, I will hold that to myself. If not even maybe a little bit higher because you know, yeah. why would you listen to me if I'm actually disingenuous? That's, that's kind of my thing for YouTube. Yeah. Um, so you being on tour for quite a long time, ten, year. <laughs> ten, 10 years, 10 years. Yeah. Okay. And that's a, that's a good, that's like a good part of your life too, between 16 and, uh, 20, 20 26, man, yep. Americans that are not professional athletes. That's when, you know, you go to prom in high school. That's when you go to college. That's when you drink your first beer, probably. That's when yeah. you get your first job. So you had a different life experience within that time frame. So yeah, I, mean, I had my own business to run basically when I was sixteen. Exactly. So, you know, I didn't have. I mean, I did have one private sponsor, but mm -hmm. um, at the time, Steffi was one in the world. Um, we had Anka Huber, who was I think between five and twelve in the world. Was she the other German uh, that um, you were? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Sabine Huck at some point was also in the mix. So I was the fourth basically at number 27. So nobody really cared that much in terms of like management or sponsorship. Um, so I was running my own business when I turned pro basically. But do you think Again, that not knowing what the heck I was doing, <laughs> but do you think that you being overshadowed by the three, um, other German women in front of you, do you, th and obviously you had to manage your own thing. You had to feel things out. So, you know, there's good things and positives. There's yeah. positives and negatives to that. But do you think that there are some very big pros that you had being overshadowed by these other women on the WTA tour and not being in the spotlight the entire time? Yeah. I mean, if, if, you know, Steffi wins every single match and every single, you know, grand slam that she plays, nobody really cares if you make it into the third round. Yeah. Um, to an ex I mean, it is a two edged sword. I mean, at the, that point I was like, okay, I'm doing really well here. <laughs> um, you know, anybody, uh, on the other hand, I see how nutty it was, you know, how, you know, there were so many demands placed on top players and you, um, you don't realize that to be perfectly honest and thank goodness social media wasn't there yeah i mean, we didn't have any of that it was bad enough to read about yourself in in the paper or see it on tv or something so i'm really taking my hat off to to you know the players out there now that that have to deal with that and hopefully deal with it well yeah. because there are some whack jobs out there so speaking of whack jobs <laughs> again What's your favorite memory when you were in professional tennis? Um, always being part of a team. That's my absolute highlight. Um, the I'm because I'm really a herd animal, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the bizarre thing. I mean, I turned out being really good in in tennis, which obviously is an individual sport. Um, but we play what. Similar to world team tennis, there's team tennis at home in Germany. And at that time, it was really booming. So you had, I mean, everybody in the top 20 playing for some club. Um, and that club that I played for was my hometown club. So I stayed, uh, you know, within, you know, where, where I'd grown up. And that's where I played the best. But it was also for the reason that you fought for somebody. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and single matches, sometimes you're playing on who knows what chord and it's loud and it's, you know, whatever. Um, and you're not having the best day. And you're like, where are you finding the energy to dig yourself out? And, and team tennis, you look over and there's your, your friends. And we were friends, actually. Yeah. You know, so it was kids that I had grown up with. We happened to three or four of us be world class or at a very, very high level. Um, that is absolutely still my, it's like, oh, man, I miss that. On the flip side, what was your most cringy or embarrassing <laughs> moment in the world of professional tennis? Um, other than having a winner forehand on court Suzanne Longla against Martina Hingis and tripping and falling on my feet, uh, on my face. Wait, wait, you beat her? No. Oh, no, no. okay. I had a set up winner and just tripped and fell on my face. In front of, <laughs> um, I actually stepped on Martina Navratilova's dog. Hmm. 
that's I managed to do that. Um, was it in her hotel room at the lobby or? It was at a, in Stone Mountain. They had that tournament one year after the Olympics. Um, and Martina played actually on the seniors tour, which was ridiculous because she could have played regular, you know, I mean, uh, so we're in the in the bathroom and you know how you wash your hands and you look across the mirror yeah, and yeah. You, you know we make eye contact and she goes like hey Micah and I'm like <laughs> and step back and because I was like holy, holy this is Martina Navratilova this is my this is the goddess yeah she remembers my name because I had played her in my first year on tour which was by then 10 years ago almost or six years or whatever and I'm like, and I'm stepping back and I'm stepping on her chihuahua. Uh, yeah. Was it, I mean, the chihuahua probably yelped quite a bit. Yes, and it was, I mean, she took it easy. I mean, Martina took it, you know, she feels like, why, you know, telling the dog basically don't, you know, flitter around like uh, amongst people's feet there. But <laughs> yeah, slightly embarrassed, slightly, you know, fangirling there a little bit and then just stepping on the dog. Yeah. So, when you first played her, um, that you know, six years ago, uh, at that point in time, th do you remember the score, or do you remember how well you did? Yeah, actually, it was, and that is another reason why she's my absolute all-time uh, hero. That was in Filderstadt. Remember where they? I mean, in Stuttgart, basically, yep. where they still, you know, where they win the Porsche. Um, and I had qualified for that was the first big event that I had gotten a uh, wild card for in the qualies, got through the qualies, and had to play her in the first round. Um, and it was a night session. I don't know how many people, 3000 people or something. And I was in the waiting area shaking like a leaf. Yeah. Like literally I thought I couldn't breathe. Um, and Martina comes over to me playing me and just puts her arm on my, my shoulder and says like, Hey, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I watched you play. You're playing fine. <laughs> Take a couple of deep breaths. Let's go and have fun. And I was like, how nice of her. <laughs> yeah. And maybe she knew that she was going to kick my butt. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but it wasn't that terrible. I mean, it was four, six, four, six, two. So wow. it was somewhat competitive. And I mean, that really stuck with me because you always hear this like, oh, it's, you know, there's so much competition. There is, there is. Um, but she really was one of the greats or is one of the greats, mm -hmm. not just because she's a great player, but I think she's also a fantastic person. Well, speaking of fantastic uh, people, and you know, I'm sure you've met a lot of fantastic people um, in the professional tennis world, and some not so fantastic, and that that's fine. You know, you're not going to get along with everybody. Are there any people that you currently keep in touch with that kind of stick out uh, for you, like on a day to day basis? I know I have friends that I haven't seen in a very long time. Obviously, never a professional tennis player, but every now and then I think about like, oh, I wonder how person A is doing or person B is doing it. Do you have thoughts like that floating around your head uh, randomly? Yeah, I mean, every now and then we're kind of, and it's kind of weird because Meredith McGrath, um, I don't know if the name rings familiar, but she was 15 or something in the world and won the US Open, I think, in doubles once mm -hmm. or in mixed or something. So we overlapped some, didn't have as much to do with each other back then, but we reconnected here because she lives in Denver as well. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, so we coached that Team Colorado together. And so we're keeping in touch um, a couple of higher level juniors that, I usually were very competitive, didn't like each other when we were kids. Yeah. Now we're really good friends. So, yeah, some. And some of my club team members I'm still in touch with or okay. I'm, I'm going to see when I go back home. It's uh, So is she doing, obviously don't give out too much information. Is she doing something yeah. tennis related as a professional living as well? Okay. Nope, not at all. Okay. No, I just... Because you said Denver's totally a different. pretty big Denver's a pretty big uh, tennis community, a lot better yeah. than what most people would. No, I, I would love to teach with her every yeah. now and then, and then that's the other thing. I mean, I really love when we, um, you know, when we coach that team together, that team, you know, elite junior selection, whatever you want to call it, um, to bounce ideas off of each other and and hey, what do you see here, and you know, what what do you think about that kid's stroke, and and just hearing her ideas, and I love that also being on a coaching team yep it's awesome and um you know I, those were the questions that i i had off the top of my head are there sure. any closing thoughts that uh you want to finish up with for our youtube or should i say your youtube audience well just i think um you know i love what people do um i think i love the not just i think i know that i love the passion 
uh, because again, that's my game. I mean, I'm making a livelihood with, with teaching the game that I love. Um, did I love it all the time now? Not necessarily all mm -hmm. the time, uh, but it's, it's a fantastic sport and I'm just taking my head off for, you know, to all people that I'm seeing on your channel on, <laughs> on acing tennis on Syria, um, that everybody's so passionate about that. And if I can help on people's journey, you know, I would love to be part of that journey. And hopefully we'll see your journey as well whether or not it's on my yeah. phone, my tablet, or my computer screen. Somewhere, somewhere <laughs> online. You will somewhere see. online. Okay, so that wraps it up. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, if you guys have any questions or comments, please leave a comment down in the section below. And like I said earlier, Mikey Babel has her own tennis channel. I will link it in this corner if you guys want to take a look at it, and you definitely should. Why wouldn't you follow someone that was literally number 27 in the world? at some point in time. So Micah, thank you very much. And I will thank follow you. up with you because I'm sure the people watching want to ask questions of their own. So we'll yeah, absolutely. be Let's glad to it. have you up sooner rather than later in the near future. Cool. All righty. Thank you. Thank you.